The Present Crisis Preface This book shall not be sent for press reviews, discolored often by reviewers' whims, nor cater to the needs of publishers, more keen on sales than merits of a work, nor flatter wearers of imperial crowns who fail to strive for a united race, nor pander to the self-indulgent rich, lax in providing earth with lasting peace, nor pamper those self-righteous holy men who thirst more for disciples than for God, nor honor egotistic scholars who, in this grave crisis, fail to serve mankind, nor humor passing readers hungry for thrill and adventure in the stuff they read. But it shall come straight before the eyes of simple, honest folk of every land, unvarnished, with no comments or remarks from high-flown commentators, who themselves benighted make the rest, too, lose their way. The appeal it makes is first addressed to those who feel like strangers in this giddy world, devoted more to flashy splendor than unceasing search for truth and lasting good whose open, loyal hearts rebel against the double norms and standards of our time, against injustice, sham, deception, fraud, masquerading as truths and principles, as clear to honest eyes as midday sun, and who devoutly pray for healthy change, so that all live in friendship, peace, and joy, true to humanity, themselves, and God. Chapter 1 The Major Cause of All Turmoil The object of this writing is to paint the world as it is, not as we believe it to be, nor as we glean from the books or every day learn from the media, nor as our vested interests dictate, nor as we choose to see it in the light of our profession, avocation, trade, position, office, color, creed, or caste, which blur our honest vision of the world and make us so oblivious to those things essential for our welfare and our growth that we must change our attitude and try to be much more objective in our views. Tis time now for this reappraisal to prevent an oncoming calamity. A hundred thousand books with varied views, as many papers with conflicting news as many scholars, writers, editors, and speakers or the media inject their thought into the passive brain of human beings ruthlessly to bring them round to their own way of seeing things, not for instructing them in what is right, nor for reporting honestly the news, nor making them aware of what is what, but for the purpose of a roaring trade, the veiling, and distortion of the truth. This faulty habit of our century to expose the extremely tender human brain to endless volleys of commercial thought, delivered mindless of its soundness, truth, integrity, or worth, for ready cash, must be reformed before it is too late. Can you believe it that the major cause for all unrest and turmoil in this age is that the highest talent and best pen are oft on sale and can be bought or sold by men in power, by traders and the rich, to throw dust into the eyes of the crowds, to make them see what they like them to see, to make them think as they wish them to think, and act as they at heart want them to act? Perhaps you are astonished at the hint, but mind of all our thinking is the mint. How can unbiased thought come out of it when it depends on someone for its bread? When in these times, with such a battle on for mere subsistence, intellect becomes subservient to one who buys her up? Who takes care of her shelter, clothes, and bread, and thus acquires a hold upon her which she cannot shake off and must put up with, however distasteful this control might be. Crowds of dependent intellects abhor their masters and their own positions, too. 
The greatest error of our day is that we have reduced the richest products of our culture to the station of a serf, to kneel before the rich and powerful and use their pen as they bid them to do, support what they approve, rebut what they dislike, thus making our supreme ideals not talent, truth, or right, but power and gold, material objects which, condemned by faith, hold e'en the God-fearing in their grip, because they know not that religion came to save evolving man from this mistake. In this discussion, pray keep in mind there are good men in every walk of life, conscientious, noble, truthful, and sincere, who try to do their duties honestly, to the best of their lights, so that no harm is done, no error made in what they do, with the approval of their conscience and their God, in the discharge of duties owed to their employers, families, and friends, and all those with whom they are somehow linked or have a place in their lives in some way. This honest class, which forms the healthy core of all societies, groups, nations, crowds, professions, occupations, hobbies, trades, of clergy, seekers after God, or those who take to mediumship or sorcery, is much outnumbered in this hectic age by those who throw all principles to winds to serve their ends, a state of malaise which, if cured not, acts like cancer on a folk who lack the impulse in to heal themselves, and turns them into a swollen, putrid mass that grows more proud the more it sinks in mud. Without this solid core of men and dames, the hollow bulk of mankind would be lost. In our allusions to the faulty gents, who are responsible for the grievous harm done by them to the race in mad pursuit of base objectives and unworthy aims, or their ambitious plans and selfish ends, the criticism is aimed at only those who overstep the bound of principles of truth, integrity, and honesty, impose upon the people or betray their trust to win success for their own plans. This gentry is in every walk of life, in business, politics, professions, trades, among the scholars, priests, the rich and poor, or psychics, yogis, ascetics and saints, tycoons, the heads of states and ministers, among the worldly and the holy both. That, more or less, designedly plays a part in adding to the already heavy load of wrong, now slowly edging mankind on towards a purifactory ordeal, which will be no respecter of one's creed or color or class in the grueling trials. No one need be offended at the thought that his or her profession, trade or craft, is made the object of derision, fun, or biting criticism or mockery. There is no aim to injure or offend, but only to expose the fallacies, effete ideas, notions, false beliefs, not noticed by their owners of their own, which need exposure in a striking way to bring the error home to those concerned. In short, the object is to expose the lies, the shams, impostures, frauds, and trickeries of which at this time mankind must be pruned to brave the storm now brewing on the verge. A storm born of the fatal weakness in the mind of man to treat the goods of earth with far more care than his own precious soul, to find destruction and extinction more acceptable than simple healthy ways of life, to woo death and take it as bride rather than give up prejudice and pride, to dig the grave of stricken progeny rather than call a halt to vanity, to brave it all for prestige, power, or rank until dismembered, broken, blind, and lame, Ten million victims of the war would crawl and hop to beg for alms, as happened in the World War II to once proud Germany. It is incredible how the brilliant minds of all the countries, as if laid with rust, can put up with the lame excuses made, or trust the explanations offered that this horrid race for more atomic wear is run to stop the other side from war, 
by using the threat of superior force to act as a deterrent for the foe.